can edit this later. Yeah. So we're live on the air. Um, this is Art I Swear is like ghetto last minute edition. I'm Vanessa Van Alstein. And I'm Katie Gibbs. And this is going to be our podcast called Gustav Klimt Like Girls. Gustav Klimt. Gustav Klimt Likes Girls. So normally I make one of us usually me make some kind of like really detailed outlines so the other one can like follow along and feel intelligent. Usually me. The following, yeah. The, and feeling intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah it's, it ain't true in real sometimes life. Sometimes it's just an illusion for everyone. Um, but life has been chaotic. <laughs> yes. Yes. Vanessa's husband's in a special place, special hospital place. And Katie got a job is the good news. And the bad news is I have less time to devote to you, my dear, my darling, my fellow podcaster, and all you people out there who are listening. And I'm sorry. And then just make sure, okay, that is. It like, it does the infinite screen. It's really painful. It hurts my head. You need a like, remote places. control for that. Okay, so Gustav Klimt. Um, you guys know this dude. As a matter of fact, I asked Katie, yeah, let's, let's, re let's relive this conversation. Who's <laughs> <laughs> like an hour ago. Go. Who's Gustav Klimt? Oh, yeah, his paintings were at Ikea this weekend. Da -dum it's really entertaining to you. He's, he's public domain. Um, he became public domain in 1988, I believe. Okay. So that's one of the reasons his work's so pervasive. The other stuff is it's so purdy. Everybody kind of recognizes him and everybody. Yeah, if you're going, is that like the people kissing with all the gold leaf? Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's clumped. That's, you know, actually, my brother in law's ex girlfriend had an original Klimt similar to the Klimt in a blue smock. That, that's an Egon Shelley. But, or, okay. but yeah, he did a lot of sketches. Really similar. Like it was a sketch and she got it super cheap at an auction house. Oh, man. And, well, she's, you know, that's how to take care of drawing should be its own podcast, but, uh, yeah, so. No touching things. I have a friend who got one because her husband had a job cleaning out the attic of a wealthy art collector and found one, and the guy had forgotten it was up there and was like, if you don't take payment, I'll give you that. So. Who, who drew it? Klimt. It was a Klimt? It was a Klimt sketch. Nice. Yeah. It's the redheaded model that shows up in a lot of his stuff. Nice. Um, so Klimt was born in 1862 um, and died in 1918. Um, he dies. It's like a brain hemorrhage that resulted from pneumonia that resulted from the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu killed a fourth of the Earth's population. Right. That's part of what ended World War I. Play. It was kind of at the end, anyways. But right. yeah, it was it was not a good time. I actually we ha I had a relative that died in boot camp during the Spanish flu outbreak. He was like nineteen, and mm. uh, yeah. So um, Clint, and away from home, and mm. Clint is from uh, it, he's from Austria. I cannot pronounce his hometown's name. He comes from a small town. Baumgarten. Baumgarten. The Baumgarten. I like Baumgarten better. It is Baumgarten. He was born in the Baumgarten. <laughs> Don't poke me in the Baumgarten. Ooh. Am I? Ooh. By the way, I want to let's let's give a shout out to somebody that says something nice about us. Did you get that email I forwarded you from, from Kin? From yeah, Kin and Kin in Great Britain is stuck on a nine-hour bus and likes that we're dry and sarcastic. Cast castigs. <laughs> This is what editing is for, kids. God, God bless you, British. We, <laughs> we, we probably wouldn't have our senses of humor if it wasn't for the British. Monty Python. Yeah. Red Dwarf. Yeah. 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 Father Ted. Yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> love to yell arse at British people and have them look at me funny. <laughs> How do you know? I just know. Anyways, Klimt spent most of his life in Vienna, Austria. You know, in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, where everybody's really hungry. Yes, and we're going to go ahead and put this out here. I don't speak German. No. Vanessa doesn't really speak German either. I don't really speak English, but it doesn't stop me from having a podcast. <laughs> doesn't stop anybody. Um, we're going to mispronounce some things, oh, and yeah. we're sorry. Sorry, Germans. 
Sorry, Austrians. Sorry, anybody that's offended by our language. I'm just really sorry, anybody that has ears. I just, if you're, I, uh, I listen to my own voice and I'm like, geez, it sounds like I'm sedated. I don't know. It's mine sounds very nasally to me. Like it's all over yeah, my sinuses. Your sinuses fuck with your ability to hear things. And, and there is my like one fuck per podcast. Oh shit. <laughs> Fuck, you said it again. We're such grown-ups today. Anyways. Uh, it has been, guys, I'm sorry. This is going to be like, what? This is going to be Agnes Martin on crack. Yeah, and, pretty much. Only it's Gustav Klimt likes girls. And with a Z. Like she said, we're having some stressful times. So just bear with us. It's okay. My husband will be calm when he gets out of the hospital. Uh. <laughs> It's okay. At some point, I'll start paying back the massive looming debt hanging over my head for being unemployed for four months. So it to damn it, please. All right. So in the time period where Gustav Klimt lives in Austria, if you're an intellectual, if you're wealthy, if you're exploring new ideas, you can hang out with a ca at a cafe with Trotsky, Freud, um, you know, Klimt loose and Hitler. Um, you know, it's, it's, he was a painter. Yeah. And he lived in Austria in like 1908. Yeah. Katie just grimaced a lot. Um, but it's, you know, ignoring the Hitler parlor because you know, old Adolf, he's just, he's the like sore thumb of the last hundred years. Um, there was a lot going on intellectually, Unfortunately, there's also a lot of social strife and poverty that's also going on, you know, on during this time period. But before World War One, if you'd have asked people what is like the romance capital of Europe, they'd have pointed you at Vienna because it's the home of the waltz. It's beautiful. It's tranquil. Their buildings are romantic. They held on to a king longer than anybody else. Now I think they'd say Paris. Right. Which I don't, I've never completely understood because I've known French people, but not that you're bad French people. We just love the, the French, maybe but Paris is dirty. And it smells weird. I've it heard. Be, yeah. well, yes, because peop, there's no public restrooms. Nobody has a public restroom. Oh, do you have to pay to go pee? Yeah. And, and it apparently, like, it adds up super quick. So, people, like, they just go anywhere. Like, if you've got a pee, you just find a bush. Well, and then, like, you've got miles of, like, weird old sewer that they still have to clean out with a like gigantic concrete ball. It's fascinating, but we're it's talking not about over. <laughs> Vienna. We're talking about Vienna. Vienna. Okay. So Gustav Klimt is born in the country to a golden graver who is from Bohemia. <laughs> did he live the Bohemian life? I'm Bobby sure his Bowen. father did being in from Bohemia and not being able to help it. La viva well! I'm gonna punch her. <laughs> so, okay, where is Bohemia? It's Czechoslovakia. So his father was a Czech. If he it, wrote a Czech and he was feeling sexy, he wrote hot checks. Yeah, that's the He was a Czech who wrote hot, hot checks. checks. Let's, let's just go with that. Um... His mother was Austrian, so he's like only half Bohemian. But I, I will say, and let's, let's not spoil too much, Klimt kind of, you know, he does like embrace the, you know, like Bohemian, like that, that like cliche of the like free. Bohem. <laughs> All right, so originally he goes to school to follow in his father's footsteps in like traditional arts, and he does something that is called architectural painting. Now, this is not a painting of architecture, which is where my brain went, and I'm going to, yeah. It, yeah, it, mine it, too. It's fitting paintings within architectural spaces that follow classic motifs. So, you know. Is it kind of like the modern, the, the 18, what's its version of having a painting over your sofa? It, if the painting was a mural. Okay. It's like, you know, we've got this like space in between the like, the relief work up here and the relief work down here. So we're gonna fill it with a painting that kind of matches because every freaking square inch of the space has to be crammed full of something. 
You, you, as you do, uh, as you do, it, that's, that it's hurts my post baroque kind of Victorian era. They, they, it's, that hurts. Let's cram as much as we can into a that. single space and call it party. And it's these early paintings; they're nice. He also does landscapes. Um, he trains at a prestigious arts and crafts museum and is considered one of their best students ever. And uh, when some of the like more prominent people die, he's considered their successor. Um, I'm kind of flipping through. I'm going to flip through some of these pictures on Wikipedia because I'm a grown up. <laughs> and uh, you can see what I've got up right now is. Uh, I'm going to guess that that translates to still water. It's like Steeler Wyther. Tranquil Pond. Tranquil Pond. There we go. It's That's there you go. You just got to um, go past the... He painted it in 1899, and it's kind of this, like, polite impressionist piece of water with trees in the background. It's very well done. I, it's not real remarkable. But, you know, what happens when you go to live in the city, you are Corrupted exposed by to more city. ideas. He, he's influenced by Japonism, which I talked about in the uh, Impressionist podcast. We have the Mamiji restoration and all this crap from Japan starts to flood into Europe that they've never seen before. The Edo prints are particularly impressive. So uh, everybody's mind's blown and they start bringing in elements of that. Um, and he kind of starts to experiment and he eventually kind of develops this like bad boy persona. And it fits in with what's called the Vienna Secession, which is this group of artists, one of the founding members was Klimt, who got together and despite their styles being very divergent and not just painters, they're also architects, a lot like the De Stiel movement, but they don't have that like solid way that everybody paints. They're kind of all over the place. And it's like, Viva La Bohem again. La Viva well. Oh man. I'm and, sorry. No, it's okay. I was waiting for the, I just, I was impressed. You got like some echo on that. Uh, it's better than me just like monotonously like, yeah, 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 fact, 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 fact. Um, I will spew facts into your ears. Slimt isn't good with people. That's a shocker. He's shy. That is a shocker. Yeah, he's a very shy man. He doesn't like, he never really gets into city life. And he didn't write a lot. And he said to biographers, anything you want to know about me is in his paintings. So uh, just, you know, having looked at the swath of his work, he likes girls. Girls, girls, girls. girls. He really likes girls. Um, <laughs> he likes them sexy. He likes them not sexy. He likes them covered up. He likes them slightly nude. I think from looking at his paintings, he was probably a tit guy. Because uh, the, the part that like is naughty that doesn't get covered up the most often is the boobs. He also like, in some of his later work, he becomes very controversial with, uh, he, he's one of the first people that puts pubic hair back on nudes which is something that does not exist in most of European history. But it still exists in Europe. Y'all yeah, still no, have pubic hair, Everybody right? has pubes. This is not a new thing, but you didn't paint them on. You kind of left like Barbie doll crotch on women because that was seen as a little more appropriate. And it's if you read like old Victorian porn or like old Victorian erotic le letters, they did think that pubic hair was like hella freaking sexy. It's like if she drops trow and like the black jungle of like nether escaping Cthulhu ness pops out, that's okay. That, that's, if I yeah. drop trow and I have the black hair of nether. You're a ginger, right? Yeah. It's, it's got, the, it's like it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, but I, you know, maybe I'm just being self-descriptive. Anyways. My nethers are ginger or nothing, damn it. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, they might, I, I've heard that that can be different. 
I've heard so too. But it's not the case with me. That's all I'm saying. Now you guys know more about her, you know. <laughs> I am so sorry. I could apologize, but I'm just really not going to. This is what we have Jillian for. and well, She's so, not going to edit this one, so. So y'all are screaming. I'm not going to be mean. Um, and make her do it at the last minute. and Because <laughs> we love you more than that, Jillian. So if you listen to this podcast, know that we love you. <laughs> So there's a three-part panel. One of the early ones he does that he reveals that's real controversial, which is philosophy, medicine, and jurisprudence. And they are relief panels on a wall. They're women in provocative stances, half naked. Um, there's a lot of natural and architectural elements introduced. Um, these made people very uncomfortable. They actually made him stop painting them and they weren't finished till later. And you'll notice that we have some really poor copies of the paintings. And why is that? <laughs> the the Waffen SS. <gasps> they decided, uh, you know, since they had to give Austria up the day before they released the castle that this was in, they burned it to the ground. And so we do not have good reproductions of these. Including all the artwork. Yeah, all they the just artwork. Thank it. you, SS. Um, what he's best known, though, for is for his gold period. Um, the kiss. Yeah, I'm trying to get to that on the pictures. I guess it's not in this. Women's. women's whatever, whatever. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, there's some women's. pornographic stuff that he does that will touch on here. <laughs> Did we just pass it? Oh, yeah. No, we did, the kiss is not showing up in this bunch. But the kiss is that famous one where, like, a man's leaning over a woman and she's kind of, like, claw kissing at him and her toes are all curled. I've heard that maybe it's supposed to actually be a violent encounter. But I'm going to apply Occam's razor here. The simplest explanation is the most possible. And you know how I said Klimt was kind of a bad boy? Well, he fully embraced the eccentric artist part. He lived out in the country with his uh, famous fashion designer girlfriend. I'm going to have to look up her name here because I'm a genius and didn't write any of this down. Uh, Emil Louise Floge. Floge. Um, it's the it's got the umlaut yeah so and they, they actually designed a lot of clothes together because she was in a like radical feminist group that was against uh corseted dressing and thought that women should dress for comfort and practicality and health above all else and apparently this was actually a fairly big movement among the upper class I, I had no to, idea. I want to hug this. Yeah, woman. no, I was like looking up. I was like, I had to like be like, I gotta quit looking this up. Not a lot of her stuff exists because in 1945 there was a mysterious house fire that burned up all of her and Klimt's costumes, a lot of his personal effects, and a few of his paintings, which is sad because he painted less than 300 paintings. Um. But his gold phase, as I was saying, is his most popular. He takes the gold work that he'd been exposed to as a little boy and introduces that as an element on canvas and includes, um, you know, architectural and design and mosaic elements that he's also been exposed to in the Viennese uh, cathedrals. <laughs> and that creates these, like, weird geometric spaces. Like, in the Kiss, they're almost like a combined amoeba right and if i get back to how his studio life was like i said he had a he had a long-term girlfriend he also had his models that he preferred and some of the upper class ladies and they would all kind of like hang out and he didn't wear knickers under his uh robes that he wore in design because it kind of saved time he, during a period of 10 years, had fathered 13 children. Don't be silly. Wrap your Whitley. 13 children. Apparently, I, I, I heard from this 
Holocaust survivor that it was just not hard to bump into a Clint bastard in Vienna during those days. Oh my god! <laughs> oh god, now, it's another one of Clint's. Yeah, oh god, Jesus. just ignore them. Apparently, when he stayed out in the country at one point, and the country people decided he was a demon and avoided him, like a wood demon. Because he looked kind of scary. He had like these wild eyes and like messy hair, and then he's running around like under pantsless and like basically a long robe that's sewed up in the front. Maybe he was like an innovator and snuggy. I don't know. But yeah, they just didn't want no part of that. I don't know what chair I'm on, but this is magical. These are, uh, I got some vintage theater seats. This is so awesome. I need to like, um, adhere them to a base at some point, but I'm going to get them restored when I finally get into a house and these are my recording chairs. They're comfy. And I'm in my place. It's yeah. Anyways. So Klimp's like bad boy bohemian life. Of course, this is not going to win points with him. He was rumored to have slept with some of the high society women that frequently um, patronized his studio. patronized his stuff. And uh, he was not a bash to say like some of his work is straight up like him depicting lesbian sex, him depicting sex. Um, and there was rumors about how he worked and it wasn't until he died that they 100% confirmed. He painted a lot of these people naked and then just added clothes and like gold leaf, which- Damn son. Yeah, like in like 1900, that is like crazy risque. And when you think about it, he probably did that with some of these like, yeah, upper class women look yeah. at that. that would be just an add-on then yeah i mean we're looking at this picture of judith with the head of holofernes from 1901 and she's in like a shimmering semi-transparent gown and she's got this like the gold leaf choker-esque type thing and then that gold leaf patterning in the background um that gets kind of this one was particularly controversial because the book of Judith is a contested book from the Bible. What it is, is it's this Jewish woman whose tribe is conquered by a Greek uh, military battalion. I, I was never in the military, so I get those terms wrong. Right. And uh, the women realize that they're doomed. So Judith, who's supposed to be very pretty, welcomes the general Holofernes into her tent, seduces him. And then while he's like, you know, getting his post coital Z's on, she cuts his head off. And that's one of the reasons like it's in some Catholic, well, it, it, even the Jews are kind of like, they're not super into this one. <laughs> um, it's a contested book. We're not super into this one. Yeah, I, and I'm going to have some like biblical scholars that want to like, you know, piss down my decapitated neck, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, were we not doing that tomorrow? Oh, I, I had scheduled it for three. Um, oh, thank God. So in this picture, she's holding his head and his head is not the focus. It's like cut off, which is another element he's taken from the Japanese and that part of her body and the head's cut off and he's not apologetic about it. It's the way you see things. Right. But the look on her face, do you want to describe that, Katie? I'm going with proud. She looks orgasmic. Very proud. Yeah, like she looks like this is the most erotic thing she has ever done. And when you consider Klimp's studio life, He's probably drawing from real life. Yeah. And this is one of the things, like one of his biggest pa patrons was Adelaide Blotch Bauer. She bought a lot of his paintings. She put one of the few people that posed for him twice. Um, and it's a, her gold portrait is one of his very famous paintings. I'm enlarging this for Katie. Look at this face and then look at that one. Oh, it's her. Yeah. There's no doubt. And I hate to say that because we'll get into the controversy that exists after World War II with the Blotchbauer paintings. But, you know, look forward to that. Yay! Um, but, you know, would Klimt have done something like that? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. 
Um, would that have hurt her stance in society? Yes. And she died in 1925, and most of her family was killed in the Holocaust, so I feel kind of bad bringing that up. But, but... We're sorry, and we love you. Another one of his real exotic painting, or exotic, erotic, erotic, he, that he got a lot of crap for was Donne from 1907. Um, this is the mythological story okay. of Zeus, uh, of Zeus. <laughs> Maybe Zeus with my Jews. Maybe that was his rap name. Zeus, Yo, Zeus Juice. Juice. <laughs> Z juice. Well, you know what? It's appropriate because Zeus came down as a stream of gold and impregnated Donne as she slept. So that is his Zeus oh. juice. It's going right between her legs. It is. I see the angle. Yeah, and this redheaded model shows up in a lot of his uh, paintings. She shows up in a lot of the ones that are like kind of lesbianic. He is known to have stated that he thought that red-headed women and black-headed women were the prettiest women. I am adorable. He would have had fun in this room. He'd have been like, hey, ladies, and we'd have been like, pull your poncho back up, you freaky little perv. <laughs> I don't need Austrian sausage. It's the Poles who are famous for that. Thank you. Thank you. Do you feel better now? Also, when you think about the fact that he had, like, 13 freaking kids. Look at Hope 2 from 1907 to 1908. This is another one of the heavily patterned pieces that occurs around the same time as The Kiss. Is it's a similar pregnant? blank background. Yeah, she looks pregnant. And as you can see, she's giving birth to like, it almost seems like coming from her womb is this like amoebic generic shape that's like both a fabric and its own like Texture. Essence, like a yeah. lot of his stuff, and it transitions into like the possibility of other women and like all of these other nature elements. But also, hidden here up at the top is the hidden skull. So, it's a reminder that with birth also comes death. Oh, honey. yeah, and that shows up in a lot of his work. Uh, I'm trying to find... Ah, here we go. This is one of the last paintings he worked on, which was Death and Life. <clears throat> Death is over to the side, and, like, it's it's a skull holding a cudgel in its skeleton hands. Right. And it's a long blue, uh, like, once again, kind of an amoebic shape with, like, crosses and other, like, funerary imagery made into the, like, black and blue colors and the... Right. The background it's is a, also black. Yeah, it's a real different color palette than you're used to with him. And on the other side is the, like, happy, friendly pastels. And there's, like, men and women in the state of sleep as if life itself is a pastelic dream with death waiting with its crudgel over to the side to take any of this mass of sleeping people from uh, its crutches. You can see that redheaded model right yep. there. It's it, and there's. Mm -hmm. I bet that's her. There, he also did a lot of landscapes that are highly patterned. This comes from a real specific period, but it's interesting because there's no real Jeez. like horizontal line, and all of nature becomes this combined illusion. His usage of like space and elements is so weird. I kind of I've never seen another artist that quite does this. And I wonder if, like, what was going on with him cognitively, because it seems like he has this, like, really weird way of thinking. Because if you think about pre-World War One art, it's so much of it, like, Impressionism is still, like, way more attached to realism than he is. Um... Yeah, this there's is about cubism, which is just the ridiculous blown out opposite. Right. Yeah, I see the pubic hair. Yeah, then this is, we're looking at now girlfriends or two women friends, 1916 to 1917. So this is right before he died. Right. Um, and yeah, you can see it's like this is obviously um, a lesbian relationship, or it's hinting that they're lesbians. Right. And he's got that. Uh, 
almost the same color pat and palette as um, the Impressionist who went to the Caribbean and... Oh, the... Uh, it's not Renoir, it's Ursula Lenar, though. It's... Rembrandt? Rembrandt. Yeah. No, wait, Rembrandt's the famous Dutch candlelight master. No. Then Are not we thinking of Gauguin? No. But you went super abstract at the end. Damn it, now I'm going to have to look it or up. Or Matisse. I think it's, it's Matisse. Matisse. There you yeah, go. Yeah, thank you. Um, Art, I swear. Art, I swear. Matisse went really abstract at the end. Give us a cookie. And, like, you have, you know, the two girlfriends is also interesting because, it's, you know, bright color palette as usual. And there's, like, the male virility symbols, like the dragon and the rooster and the swan that kind of hints at like Zeus from mythology. Right. Which he's already alluded to in others. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's once you realize that it, it's just not subtle. Um, his Beethoven frieze is also kind of loaded with that stuff. There's not a great picture of it on this. Um, the wall pieces with the tree of life that he did. If you look at them, it's obviously like, a woman waiting for her lover and then a couple having sex under a blanket. Here's another one I like a lot from 1905, The Three Ages of Women. That's really cool. He has like some real, like you can tell he worked with architectural pieces when you look at this mm -hmm. because there's that blank swath behind it that makes it both kind of like a bed but sets a horizon line at the same time. Um. And then you have like two figures that are obviously laying down and then one figure that's obviously standing up, which is done so well, you don't notice it. Like you don't notice that that's weird right? until you really study it. And it's a small child girl, the redheaded model he obviously liked a whole lot, who's got like flowers in her hair and is obviously like a fertile youth. And then like the old crone who's withered and sagging and has her hands over her face as if she's trying not to look back on her uh, virile past that she's no longer a part of. And it transitions from these like light pastel blues and these like real circular fertility shapes to these like flattened out like ochres and more earth tones for the crone as if she's about to return to the earth. And, and you'll see it in her hands and like her lower extremity, extremities too. She already looks like she's kind of desiccated, like she's already starting to dry out there. Yeah, and he did at this point, he had worked with Egon Schiele, who's another one of Austria's very famous um, modern painters. And you can see in the crone, I feel like specifically that um, appreciation Chile has for the grotesque in the figure that the broken and twisted quality of like bones and flesh is interesting to him. Right. And he does it to people who aren't necessarily old in his work. Um, but they were contemporaries. They did talk. Um, Chile kind of learned from Klimt. So that's an interesting thing to note at this point. Um, <clears throat> While we're, well, I didn't, I said we were in the Wikipedia article for some of these because they had them in nice order. Klimt also released several folios that were like precise reproductions of his work. Um, a very later one was his drawings. And this is when he kind of let it be known that he did create erotic work. And this is, I probably should have like warned people, but at this point, you should know. You should probably know. Um, Don't let your kids listen to our podcast. This is probably one of his most famous drawings. It's a woman masturbating. She's There's a slit in bloomers, if you don't know that, and she's just kind of taking advantage. And she's this, like, you can see how because of the position she's in, it, her clothes have, like, bunched up, and he's kind of, like, treated that as, like, its own entity. And like the, but the flesh parts are still uh, revealed and considered. So it's like a hint at how he appreciates paintings and what's he's what he's thinking. Right. Um, some of these other ones are very hard to see, but you can kind of like get a sense of like he draws the boobs really well. 
and then the, not, the butts were lies, and then like her legs are just kind of gone. It's like, yeah. what are you interested in, Gustav? What are you looking at? Where do you, Occam's razor, simplest explanation is gonna gonna be the best. Um, <clears throat> but one of the interesting things, of course, is the period of time that he's in. He stays in Austria through World War One. And uh, he's patronized by several wealthy Jewish people, which in Austria at the time, they couldn't vote. They didn't have any political say. Most of them are refugees from pogroms in other countries like Kiev in the Ukraine. Um, so part of how they expressed their wealth and position in society was arts patronage because you can start to curate how the culture sees. <clears throat> well played. The Blockbauer family, Friedrich and his wife, Adele, Adela, Adele. Adele. Uh, very much involved patrons of the arts. Uh, she dies very young in the 1920s. And she left a will in 1925 that said since she pushed her husband to purchase these clips and they were kind of hers, that she would like them to go to the country that she loved and treated her so well, Austria. This becomes a problem later when her husband survives her into the 40s and has to spend the rest of his life in Switzerland because he's Jewish. Uh, her nieces and nephews, who she was very close to, had to flee to the United States and never went back to Austria. Damn. And, um, now, when he left Austria, Frederick had to leave behind everything he owned, and Klimt has always been considered kind of a uh, jewel of Austrian heritage. Like, they're... Vienna is proud of him. Right. Um, Which so, I don't assume made the Germans happy. No, because this is like degenerate abstract art, but it's real enough. It wasn't a big threat, so it wasn't actively destroyed. So these block bowers, including the portraits, were retained within Austria by the Nazis. And when it came to people coming back after the war and being like, hey, I'd like my stuff back, Austria considered the value. And so basically they're like, we consider this Blockbauer portrait one of the most well-known and enigmatic Klimt to be of such a national value. We will not give it to you no. But in exchange for not contesting this, we will give you free access to this item, this item, this item, and this item, and make it easier to export. So a lot of people are just glad to have enough of their stuff back that they can either sell it or keep it or donate it accordingly. And when it came to the Blockbauer paintings, they have such a high value. And she had originally said Austria treated it so good, they argued that her will superseded Friedrich's wishes and that it should be owned by Austria. I would point out, this is not, the Austria that he fled was not the Austria she was in love with. That's fair. I mean, that's like tw nearly 20 years apart. Right. Um, so there was one of her nieces who knew her very well and survived the Holocaust and lives here in the United States in the 80s actually successfully sued Austria and almost caused an international incident and proved that number one, that was a request in the will and that there's never been a case where a request in a will supersedes somebody's later wishes that it was a stolen uh, article of war and that the national value does not excuse the fact that the Austrians participated in the atrocities of the Holocaust and it was given back to her. 
And as you can see, she sold it at Christie's for a record of $135 million. So Damn. Uh, that's a long time to wait for, like this happened in the, two, the early 2000s. It's a very long time to wait to make it right, but it was eventually made right. And it's one of, their successfully doing that was some of what has allowed people to go back and successfully claim things that were wrongfully taken by the Nazis because, you know, the Austrian government, they want to step away from the anti-Semitism that led to the re this, this whole mess, the unification right. with the Nazis and taking things from people and keeping things from people. <clears throat> and they don't want to make it look like over the long term they actively deceived people, people and like Even though they defrauded did. people. But yeah, so it's... But like she literally had to go before the Ninth Appellate Court uh, and argue against the country of Austria that it was okay for her to sue Damn. because Austria was saying, if you sue us, this could create an international incident because we're going to be mad at the United States for allowing a citizen to, cause it's, if I got mad at Japan, I can't just sue Japan. Right. Uh, if like they commit copyright fraud, that's one thing. But like this is it is it was a very weird legal thing and there's some interesting documentaries about it which I would encourage people to check out. There's also a film on Klimt by um, it stars John Malkovich. Okay, because <laughs> who would you have play that? Yeah, why not? Screwy eyed, squirrely motherfucker Steve John Malkovich. Buscemi. Yeah, Steve Steve Buscemi's like too squirrely looking. It's John Malkovich. He's the right level of weird. I haven't seen it. I can't attest to how realistic it is. Like I said, Klimp was a shy guy that kind of kept to himself. So he I, was a shy guy. Shy guy, like like from Mario. Yeah. I have a frog named Shy Guy. Guess why he's named Shy Guy. He's shy. That's like, yeah, she's imitating a shy guy right now. Um there's a reason you keep me around. That's my shy guy impression. I keep you around. It is. But um, another interesting thing about Clint paintings is they are the top record breakers for sold paintings in recent years. They far surpassed Picasso and Van Gogh, who used to be Number at the top one. of the list. Um, one of the reason Clint's stuff is becoming more valuable than either one of those guys is they were very prolific painters. Right. Van Gogh, not as much as Picasso, but with Picasso, you have thousands and thousands of pieces of work. So none of his stuff is particularly rare. There are some Picassos that are only worth like five or 10 grand. Um, you know, with, but with Klimt, number, partly because of, you know, with this real popular gold period, you have the value of the gold to consider. Right. But it's going to exceed that because the paintings are so rare. I think it, it, like I said, it was less than 300 in his lifetime, definitely less than 250. And then you have to consider that a good proportion of them have been burned or are murals or mosaics or just something that cannot right. um, really be resold. I know the house that the Tree of Life is in is now owned by the Austrian government and it's part of like preservational efforts because the house that it's in is also a very famous piece of our uh, Austrian architecture. Am I getting really boring now? No, I'm paying attention. Like, I swear. You're playing a game. My 80. I know. The 80, the 80, the 80, the 80. I, I am paying attention. Squirrel nut clint. Yeah, no, the Austrian government owns the house where the tree of life is. Yeah. And which is actually a very important site in and of itself. Yep. See, paying attention. Paying attention. And good job, Katie. Good I, job. No, I can do like forty thousand things at once too. As soon as I scroll through the Wikipedia article to make sure I mentioned everything. You got me in this stupid game anyway. Just so you know. Yeah, garden, garden escapes. It's God. It's the matching game from hell because it's so much fun and disturbing. So that's uh this is this is our Gustav Klimt podcast. Sorry it's so disjointed. Like I said, 
life has been really crazy. It's been a shit. It's been just, we're, we're, we're it's, yeah, I'm gonna, cause I threw out my back again on top of everything. So I've been like really goofy on me back medication yet again. If you missed like goofy high Vanessa, it, she's back. Yeah, I love Goofy High Vanessa. She's my favorite. She's back and she's goofier and higher than ever before. And uh and yeah. I'm just like You have like stress. two kids, a husband, and a full time job now. So that's... Dude, I I spent just before this podcast, before coming over and rescuing Vanessa's axolotl. Um Yeah. Poor Pinky. Poor Pinky. She's got a new I love her. She basically has her own refrigerator now that keeps her house cold, so she'll be all right. Nice. But before that, I spent two hours on the phone with Frontier. And and like the phone jockeys at Frontier, I'm looking at you, Tony and Raven. You y'all were awesome, but may I tell you that Frontier can bite my left keister. Raven? That's I swear I think that's her name. It, uh, I'm just having flashbacks to when we were younger and went to goth clubs because that was like every other person or some form of angel or some form of bear or some form of unholy raven angel bear hybrid. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah. And, and now all I can think of is the DC uh, Teen Titans character, but they like Teen Titans Go is the worst. I mean, it's it's good for what it is, but it ruined Teen Titans. So, so I want to I want to put a challenge forth to Art I Swear listeners. So, what Gustav Klimt thing do you have? Is it a cookie tin? Is it a poster? Is it your favorite journal? Is it a tattoo? Is it some shoes? Ooh. Do you have a T-shirt? What what is it? Share it. Share it on our Facebook page, Twitter, or you can email us at Art I Swear. Ooh, uh, uh, nail art. Nail Gustav art. Klimt nail yeah, art. That would look good. That would that would be pretty freaking styling. Even if you don't like gold, you've got like other options. And if you have a Gustav Klimt tattoo, how did you get that gold patterning in? I need to know. For a friend. Um, for a friend, yeah. For the, uh, uh, and, uh, by the way, uh, props to Joe Tricconi, our tattoo artist for like putting up with the both of us at the same time. Oh my God, that poor man. Some people run away when they see us together. Most people, including our husbands. We're not kidding. Mm -mm. Yeah, anyways. Um, so yeah, uh, that's gonna be our artist shout out for this week, I think. So if you're in the Dallas area or headed to the Dallas area, may we recommend Legacy Arts Tattoo, located at 635 McCoy. Ask for Joe Tricomi. Or Kelly. Kelly's actually pretty awesome, too. Kelly's he, good. So is Amanda. Amanda's awesome. Really, anybody there, it's a clean shop. They're well run. Um, they're a fantastic bunch of people, and we love them very much, mostly for putting up with us. Also for throwing out the scary lady with the temporary tattoos and the athletic shorts the other night. Oh, my God. She came up to me. She's like, do you, know, do you work here? And I've got, like, the new tattoo crap on my arm, and it's like, no. It was... And she's like, do you know the owner, Jim Tricconi? And I'm like, does she mean Joe? No. Because <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> talk to her. So she goes in and Katie's getting tattooed. And and when I'm getting, this is a back piece. I mean, not a large one. It's on my shoulder. But I am face down. I've got a dude that that has been paid money for this to stick needles into my skin. And I've got an actually surprisingly high pain tolerance for this stuff. Yeah, you do. Um, but it's a very vulnerable vulnerable position. Yeah, because you get your shirt, like, half off. You I know? do, yeah. And, like, shit's hanging out, like, not all the way, but, like, I'm not. And I can't get up and run away because, like I said, needle skin. Um, and this lady starts coming over to my, to the guy that's tattooing me and asking about a job. All right, I guess it sounds like he knows her. But as a conver conversation progresses, it is obvious, one, that my artist does not know this lady. Two, she is batshit freaking crazy. Like, she's telling my artist, who has spent years getting a graphic design degree and then years more learning how to tattoo without screwing things up and 
she's showing him temporary tattoos that are very obviously newly adhered to her body, all three of them, as her portfolio of work. And she offered to pay for a cap of white to yeah. take to the bazaar. Because she wanted a cap of white ink, just, just a cap, no lid, no nothing, to take back to her house to do scratcher tattoos on herself. I guess, I don't know, but... Yeah, Joe was like, no. So what do you want? Hep C to go? No. Yes, apparently in the state of Texas, you do not have to have a license to tattoo. So you've got, like, a bounty of options in catching Hep C or many other disgusting diseases. I, for one, like the Hep C MRSA combo. Oh, that's a great combo. Hep MRSA? Hepsa? Hepsa. Yeah. There you go. Herpsa. Herpsa. Oh, the gonosyphil herpalades. Woo! All right. So there's, don't make sure your tattoo artist is licensed if you live in the state of Texas is where we're going. Also, uh, shout out to Camel. Uh, shout out to England and the Netherlands who's been listening to us more and more. And uh, Hi, guys. We love you over the pond. We're sorry about Brexit, but please take us back anyway. Because we're sorry about our commander in Cheeto. Oh, God. Anyways. Um, we're sorry. We have no control over him or his Twitter. Yeah. Um, if we did, we'd shut that shit down hard. All right. I think we need to get going. Because no. my cat, who's been stuck in here, is like looking at the door and looking at me. And I think the claws are about to come out. Oh, yeah. That's the evil one. Thank you for listening to Art I Swear. I'm Katie Gibbs. I am Vanessa Van Alstein. Um, intro and outro by Joe Giggs, who's a New York City DJ that does not make you get naked to, you know, DJ. Or maybe he does. We don't know how he accepts it. Whatever, whatever you want, Joe will do it. No. Oh, my God. The sweet Joe's my wife. <laughs> um, thanks for the <laughs> Thank you, Joe Giggs. project for samples. Have a creative day. And, and you know. we'll be better put together next time. We sort of kind of promise. Just admit it. You guys love it when we're a cluster F. Yeah, well, right. it's what we do. Hanging up now. Bye.